Hi, Rich Neapolitan again. Uh, today I'll be talking about the meaning of probability. Uh, I've alluded to this a little bit before when I talked about the relative frequency approach to probability and Carrick's experiments while in jail showing that uh, relative frequencies do appear to exist. But today I'll go into a little bit more detail contrasting the two approaches to probability. The two main approaches, there actually are some others. And the two predominant approaches are the frequentist approach, is the first one. That's the one I mentioned before, and I mentioned Richard von Mises is the name most associated with this as a probabilist. But as far as statisticians go, um, Fisher and Neyman are the most well-known, especially Ronald Fisher. Uh, 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 he's the, probably the most famous statistician of all time. Uh, we've got a number of tests named after him and, and the like. Then there is the Bayesian approach to probability, named after the Reverend Thomas Bayes, and we'll see why in this talk. And these are some of the well-known names associated with it. Um, only, actually, one of these people is still alive to this day. That's Dennis Lindley. When I first got involved in this field in the, in the mid-80s, mid approximately, and he was already um, not young at that point, I actually, that was before we had all the internet axes that we have now, and I used to write back and forth with him to England, uh, asking him questions, and he would send back uh, typewritten notes, but with whiteout on them. I was using a computer at that time, but, and I just pictured this, this, this famous statistician sitting by, by a candle, uh, writing on this old, big old typewriter. Uh, anyway, he is a great statistician, I.J. Good. Also a famous statistician who just died. He was one of the people who um, decoded Enigma using Bayesian, Bayesian statistics. So all these people are, um, are well known in their fields and contributed a lot to their fields. All right, so what is the difference between the two approaches? Here's the coin toss again. And as I mentioned before, the frequentist view is that a probability is the limit. As an experiment, number of times experiment is, is, is performed of the number of, t of successes or number of uh, outcomes of heads, in this case, divided by the number. That's, that would be the probability of heads. Uh, like I said, the probability of, of um, having cancer given you smoke would be take, the limit is you take a bunch of people who smoke, what fraction of them have lung cancer. All right, that's the frequentist view. The Bayesian view, and we'll see why it's called Bayesian, is that not everything can be handled by a relative frequency. For instance, if you're going to watch a football game, all right, you have many people bet on football games, right? They want to know the chances of one team winning. That's not a relative frequency. You don't repeat that same game over and over again under the same circumstances. But you can view it in terms of betting behavior. If I think the Bears are more likely to win, then I might say, I will give you $60 if the Bears lose, if you will give me 40 if they win. Obviously, I think they're more likely to win because I'm willing to put up more money than I'm willing to take. I will take either side of this bet because I think it's a fair bet. Then according to the Bayesian view, the probability is 0.6. Notice I say P sub neo because this is my personal probability. It's not a relative frequency. It's not the result of an experiment. It's what I believe. Somebody else who thinks the Bears are more likely to win would make this number bigger. Somebody who thinks they're less likely to win would make it smaller. Now, the Bayesian view does not ignore relative frequencies. In this, in this short talk, I can't go into very much about the whole philosophy of these views, but DeFinetti, uh, another famous Bayesian, has, has shown that if we make certain reasonable beliefs about the assumptions about a person's beliefs, they have to believe their belief their Bayesian view has to be a relative frequency. In other words, if I did toss a thumbtack a thousand times and it came up heads 371 times, for me, the probability of heads would have to be about 0.371 if, I, if you make reasonable assumptions about how I determine probabilities. I would be kind of foolish, right, if I thought it was 0.999 after only landed heads 371 times. I mean, and, and Again, we more or less assume a person is not foolish, so the Bayesian view kind of subsumes the frequentist view in the sense that Bayesians do believe in relative frequencies. They just extend it to 
events that are not relative frequencies. Now, introducing Bayesian probability of a sporting event clearly demonstrates that it applies to events that are not repeatable. However, the use of this domain, sometimes people think it's trivial to talk about sports and betting on games. But in actually many, and you can, some people could argue most uncertain events are not repeatable. Consider the stock market in the coming month, especially this coming month with the debt ceiling thing and everything. What's going to happen to it? Nobody knows, but people are making guesses and buying or selling stocks depending upon the, that, their belief. Uh, when, when we had the financial meltdown, the people who were somewhat responsible for it said they underestimated the risk. In other words, they, they were saying that the probability that they assigned to the housing market collapse was, was less than what really was the case. So in, in many domains, medical diagnosis, when I talk about the probability of a particular patient having a disease, I base it on relative frequencies, but in the last analysis, I base it on all my information about the patient, and it's really my belief about this particular patient. That is the Bayesian view. Now, it's important in statistics to do hypothesis testing. This is not a statistics course. I, I highly recommend if you, everybody taking a, a st the probability and the statistics course, but I'm going to briefly talk about hypothesis testing to show you the contrast in the two approaches. In statistical hypothesis testing, we update our belief about some hypothesis based on data. I'm going to show how the two approaches handle hypothesis testing with a few examples. The frequentist approach, <laughs> there's my, you're probably going to sick of seeing that coin. Um, take a coin from your pocket and toss it 10 times. Suppose it lands heads every time. That's not what you expected, right? You expect to land heads about five times. Should we reject the hypothesis that it's fair? By a fair, we mean the, should we reject that the probability of heads is 0.5? In the frequentist approach, you make that your, your null hypothesis, that it is a fair coin. And then you look at the distribution of, of heads if it's a fair coin. And this is the distribution. The probability of the landing heads five times is, is almost 0.25 if the coin is fair. The probability of landing had six times is less, by landing seven times is less, and the probability of landing 10 times is almost zero. So the, if the coin is fair and you toss the coin 10 times, these are the probabilities of it landing zero times, one time, two times, three times, and so on. One of these has to happen. So these numbers add up to one. Actually, the probability of getting 10 heads is only 0 0.0009. So if this coin is fair, the probability of the outcome we observed is extremely small. In the frequency this view of statistics, that is called the significance or the p-value of the result. It's traditional, and I won't go into this, to this talk, that if this number is 0 0.05 or less, the result is considered significant and worthy of publication. So in other words, we would consider it a significant result and that this coin is not fair because it landed heads 10 times. But, I'm going before I go on, if the coin came out of your pocket, it's the common coin, you would, would you really think that it's probably not fair just because it landed heads 10 times? I mean, I wouldn't because I... I would just think an unusual event happened because I, I had this prior feeling about this coin that it probably is fair, and I, I'm not going to overwhelm it with 10 outcomes. Let's perform a randomized control experiment to test a new drug for blood pressure. And placebo is something which we've known to have no effect on blood pressure. And 51 people who have the placebo have reduced blood pressure, 49 do not. In the medicine I'm checking, 70 people have reduced blood pressure and 30 do not. This tends to look, based on this study, that the blood pressure medicine is probably effective. Using a chi-square test, again, this gets into statistics, but I'm just getting, I just want to go over the numbers here. The probability of having this result or something more extreme is 0 0.006. That's the p-value of this result. It is significant by the criterion that 0.05 or less is significant, but 
It's interesting that this is a less significant result than the coin toss, yet I personally would tend to believe from this result that the medicine is effective, and I would tend to still not believe that the coin was unfair. And why? Because of my prior beliefs that this blood pressure medicine is likely to work because otherwise they wouldn't have spent time developing it. So they must, when you develop a medicine, there's biological reasons to believe it might work. Again, in the coin, I had no reason at all to believe it was unfair. I've alluded to this quite a bit about my prior belief wouldn't have been overwhelmed. And like I said, the, the key thing about the frequentist approach is it doesn't allow you to have prior beliefs. It only talks about significance of tests and I'll talk about power shortly. The probability of having this result if something is true. The Bayesian st statistics involves updating prior belief based on Bayes' theorem, and that's why it's called the Bayesian approach. I mean, now we're getting to why this is called Bayesian. This is our example before, so I'm going to go through it very quickly. Suppose Joe is about to get married, and he takes a routine blood test for HIV, and the test comes back positive. Again, this is the, these are the same numbers I had before. I'm just going to note what they're called in, in, in the frequentist terminology. This is called the significance of the test. It's like the p-value. The probability is positive, again, HIV is absent, is 0 0.002. This is called the power of the test. And the and I called it before the, the true positive rate, but the, in, in the frequentist terminology, it's called the power. In the frequentist approach, we would stop at this point and conclude that a very significant thing had happened when he tested positive and would probably end up believing that he had HIV. But in the Bayesian approach, we have this prior probability that HIV is present. Again, in the frequentist approach, you're not allowed to use numbers like this. You can only look at the probability of a result given a hypothetical condition. The Bayesian approach, you're allowed to use Bayes' theorem and prior probabilities and update your belief in this fashion. All right, so you can tell that I'm more or less a Bayesian, all right, by the, <laughs> by the way I presented this. It's up to you to, 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 to figure out where you, where you, how you feel about this, but I, thought, I think it's important to think about it, these two approaches to statistics. The Bayesian approach is becoming more and more predominant for, for most of the last century. It, it was it fell into disfavor. In fact, it, but in the early 20th century, Carl Pearson, the famous Ronald Fisher, they were Bayesians. The Bay, but Fisher in 1921's change, he said the Bayesian approach depends upon an arbitrary assumption. So the whole method has been widely discredited. You have to realize, thinking in terms of history, this was the era of logical positivism, when that positivism became predominant, and science was becoming consumed with this uh, notion that the data must tell us everything. Here's another quote from Ronald Fisher. There is a picture of Ronald Fisher, by the way, at that time. Inverse probability, like an impenetrable jungle, arrests progress towards precision of statistical concepts. This I, by inverse probability means using Bayes' theorem and having prior probabilities. So many of these probabilities required personal judgment. And the statistics that was developed, the frequent statistics, endeavored and succeeded in getting rid of that because they felt that it led towards imprecision, that we had to let the data tell us everything. But in the last 20, 30 years, the Bayesian approach has made a strong comeback because people realized, this, I think it was, I, I'm not a historian, but I think it did have a lot to do with the emergence of artificial intelligence, machine learning, informatics and the realization that we needed to update our belief and we needed we couldn't just look at statistical tests and um, the Bayesian approach has become much more um, acceptable in medicine although the frequency approach is still very much used also again my goal here was to show you the two approaches so you would think about them um, and I'll leave it at that um, this talk is over, and I will talk to you later.